Okay, here we go. I am working from Father Paolo's notes from the English translation of his first lecture in the series Spiritual Therapy for Spiritual Sicknesses. I am going to go point for point from Father Paolo's lecture. So let's get started on Spiritual Therapy for Spiritual Sickness, lesson number one. The first question that we need to consider is this. What type of salvation does Jesus offer us? Now, the first thing we need to do is consider the meaning of the word salvation. Normally, we use salvation either in a religious sense, which means it's a, it's a word with a religious meaning, or in English, it means to save somebody from a terrible situation. Maybe someone is trapped in a burning building on fire and a fireman goes in and picks them up and carries them out. He has saved them. That is salvation. They have been saved. But Father Paolo is using the word to mean something more like a cure, a cure for disease, a medicine, a cure. So, Father Paolo says his first main point is that salvation and cure are the same thing. In Hebrew and Greek, apparently, the same word is used to mean salvation and cure. Um, there's a Bible verse where Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. Right after Jesus performs a miraculous healing. But in a different translation of the same verse, it says, go, your faith has saved you. So you see that great translators who know the language very well, in one case translated a word healed, and in another case translated the same word saved. In Greek, the word for cure and the word for salvation is sozo, sozo. And in theology, the word for the study of salvation is soteria, soteria. They come from the same word, the same root. So when we study the salvation that Jesus brings us, we have to understand that there is a relationship between salvation and healing or cure. In fact, the name Jesus, which some pronounce as Yeshua or Joshua in English, means the Lord who saves us. It also means the Lord who heals us. Salvation and cure. Healing and cure are the same thing. So when we get close to Jesus, we get close to the person who can cure us, the person who can heal us. Now, what is the usual way that people think about salvation in the religious sense? Well, usually they think of it as a payback. Um, 
a payment for sin. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. But it is important for us to see that this is a metaphor, a comparison. It cannot be taken literally. Saint Gregory of Nazianus, who was a fourth century theologian, he was a doctor of the church, a very great thinker, clarified this concept for us. First, he said that the word used for um, salvation as a debt to be paid was the same word as was used for the redeeming of a slave. If a person was a slave and they wanted to be free, they would have to be they would have to pay a price to their master um, or someone else would have to pay for them to redeem them so they could be free. They could uh, save them from slavery by paying a price, a debt, and then the person was free. And if that is the metaphor, the purchasing of a person out of slavery, then St. Gregory asks, well, to whom is the ransom paid? Who gets the money? Who, um, to whom is the debt paid? And Gregory asks, well, um, do we pay to the devil? Does the devil own us and we have to be ransomed out of slavery to the devil or to sin? Well, St. Gregory says, definitely not. Of course not. That would be terrible. The devil is the one who started the sin problem in the first place. Should he benefit? Should he profit? Also, the payment comes from God himself. In fact, the payment is God himself. Should God himself be paid to the devil? Definitely not. Saint Gregory points out that this would be impossible. But the next question is, well, is the debt paid to God? Well, at this point, we have to think and reflect. And St. Gregory points out that in the story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac, which is in the Bible, this story is in the Bible. If you remember the story correctly, Abraham was without children until he was very old, even though God had promised him that he would be the father of nations. Yet, he was without children until he was very old. And then God gave him a son, Isaac. Isaac means son of laughter. And Isaac was received with great joy. But when he was 14 years old or so, God told Abraham, to take Isaac up the hill and sacrifice him as a burnt offering to God. God wanted to see if Abraham would withhold his most cherished, most beloved son. And Abraham did not withhold him. He took the boy up, but at the very moment when he was about to plunge a knife into his son's breast, to kill him and offer him as a burnt offering, an angel spoke to Abraham and said, no, don't do it. Don't kill the boy. And at that moment, Abraham raised his eyes and he noticed a ram, a goat, caught in a bush over to the side. And quickly, Abraham let the boy go and went and got the goat and sacrificed that to God instead. 
God provided the ram. So St. Gregory points out that if God had compassion on Isaac, wouldn't he even more have compassion on Jesus, his own beloved son? Anyway, St. Gregory, in his discourse, makes it clear that this argument that salvation is the payment of a debt cannot be taken literally. So, can we speak of salvation as the payment of a debt? Yes, but we have to remember that it is a metaphor. It's not a literal reality. It's not the whole story. It was by taking this metaphor literally that some of the theologians of the 17th and 18th centuries ended up speaking crazy things and terrible things about God. They um, put forth an image of God as a bloody tyrant who could only be satisfied by bloodshed. Their God was demanding sacrifices in the shedding of real blood. And this is a horrible image of God. And it doesn't at all correspond to the God we see in the scripture. So this idea of atonement, this idea of salvation as the payment of a debt can't be taken literally. The image of God we have in the scriptures is more like the God of the parable of the prodigal son. Now, for those of you who don't know that parable, Jesus told this as a parable, a story, that was supposed to show us what God the Father is like. And it was a story of a father who had two sons and the younger son came to him one day and said, I don't want to wait till you die to get my money, my inheritance, my, my inheritance. I want my money now and I want to leave. And the father was terribly hurt, but he spoke to his accountant and he sold off property and he gave this son his portion of the inheritance that he would have when the father died. And the boy walked off and left with his money in his pocket and the father did not hear from him again for a long time. And the boy went off and spent the money in sinful living with prostitutes, drugs, alcohol, just went through the money. Meanwhile, the other son, the older son, stayed by his father's side and worked the farm and did everything his father asked. He was a good son. After a few years, the younger son ran out of money and became hungry and decided to come home to his father. And when the father saw the son coming from a distance, he was accustomed to watching the road because he missed his son so much. So he saw him coming from a long way away and he ran out to meet him. And when the son um, came near, the son began to apologize. He began to say, oh, father, I'm sorry. Please take me back. But the son didn't have a chance to say that because the father tackled him and hugged him and kissed him and wept and cried and said, welcome home, I'm glad you're home. And then he threw a party for him. Meanwhile, the older son was angry and said, how can you do this? How can you treat this horrible son like a prince? And the father said, well, you, my older son, you are always with me and you have everything I own. It's all yours. But this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive. So please celebrate with me. 
So that story, which is called The Prodigal Son, is a story which shows us what God is like. God is not a bloody, vindictive tyrant. He's a loving father who wants his son back. So we cannot understand that salvation is the literal payment of a debt that must be paid in blood. Although the payment of a debt is a metaphor or a comparison that we can use to understand salvation. One thing you need to understand and make it very clear in your mind, and that is this. There is no one way to understand God or to understand salvation. We need many metaphors. That's because the concept of God is so big that we cannot understand it with only one paradigm. We have to understand it from many perspectives. And it's the same way with salvation. So no one metaphor is going to be enough. We're going to need many of them. And this idea that salvation is a cure or a healing is only one of many metaphors. But it is a very rich metaphor. It's a concept which can yield great fruit, good fruit, um, in our lives if we can get a hold of it. So, let me talk a little bit about this idea of healing or cure. First, let me tell you a little story about um, the birth of a baby. A young mother had her first baby. And as she was looking at this baby, she was astonished by the miracle of the new birth. And she thought it was such a crazy, strange thing that she had a baby in her arms where one day ago there was no baby in her arms. And she said to the nurse who was standing by, she said, look at his little hands, look at his little feet. It seems so unusual that he should have such perfect little hands and feet. And the nurse, who had seen a million births, replied dryly, it would be a lot more unusual if he didn't have perfect hands and perfect feet. The mother thought it was unusual in the sense of wondrous that the child should be perfect. And the nurse pointed out that it was usual in the sense of normal, that he should be perfect. Well, when we understand salvation, in the sense of a cure, we need to understand that human beings are not in our usual state in the sense of being perfect and healthy. We are in the unusual state of not being perfect and healthy. Human beings are sick. Human beings are not what they should be according to God's original plan. When God designed humanity in his, in his head, in his heart, in his creative faculty, he imagined human beings to be immortal and perfect. But when the first father and the first mother, Adam and Eve, fell and sinned, they 
became unusual. They became abnormal. They became sick. And they passed on this sickness to the rest of us, to all of the children of Adam and Eve. And since that day, there has only been one human being who has been usual in the sense of being perfect. And that's Jesus Christ. All the rest of us are in a state of abnormality, of sickness, of sin. Let me tell you another use of the word normal and abnormal. When a doctor thinks that you might have cancer, he takes a biopsy. He takes a sample of the cells of your body and he looks at them under a microscope. And if he says, there are no abnormal cells, no abnormal cells, that means you are healthy. All of your cells are normal in the sense of being healthy. But if there are cancer cells, he says, I saw abnormal cells. You have cancer. Everybody in the world today has abnormal cells. Everybody has spiritual cancer. You have never met a normal person, a healthy person. Everybody you have met is in a state of abnormality. The theological term for this is post-lapsarian. Now, a lapse is a failure or a fall. Post-lapsarian means after the fall. Adam and Eve fell, and after they fell from grace, they were in their post-lapsarian state. And all of their children were born into that as well. We need to convince ourselves of this because if we don't believe we have a problem, we will not seek a cure. The first step to healing is to realize that you are sick. The world, the unconverted part of the world, and even the unconverted part in us, believes that what everybody does is normal. They use the word normal in a different sense than I have been using it. They use the word normal to mean common. Everybody does it. They also think of the word normal to mean healthy and correct, as I have used it. So they confuse two meanings of the word normal together, and this creates a confusion in their minds. They think that because everybody does something, it must be good. Since this behavior is normal, it must be healthy. They say about masturbation, for example, everybody does it. It's normal. Well, first of all, everybody does not do it. And second of all, even if they did, it would not be normal in the sense of healthy. For example, in the 19th century, Cuiaba, a city in Brazil, 
had an epidemic of smallpox. It was called the bladder epidemic because everybody who had it looked like they had bladders hanging all over them. They were called bladdery people. Um, and half of the population of Cuiaba died of this. But did that mean that the condition was normal? No, it was an illness. Literally everyone gets a cold now and again, but does that make colds normal in the sense of healthy? No, they are normal in the sense of common, but not normal in the sense of healthy. So do you see the confusion? You cannot say common means healthy. In many cases, something is common, but it is unhealthy. We need to realize that the reactions that we have may be normal in the sense of common, but they are not healthy in the sense of what God intended a human being to be. So we need to understand and change our mentality to understand that we are people who have been deformed by original sin. A disorder, like a sickness, exists inside of us. Our nature is fallen and we need treatment to become right. The world does not have this mentality. They think that what is normal is right and that everybody is okay the way they are and that we need to celebrate the behaviors that people naturally do. But that results in forcing us to celebrate things that are destructive and wrong. We need to take the consequences of original sin seriously. In the last symposium that took place in the National Eucharistic Congress in Florianopolis in 2006, uh, a priest, I'm going to try to say his name, he was Brazilian, Father João Batiste, Batista, sorry, Libanio, who is a great liberation, liberation theologian, he tried to make the point that there is no original sin, or that if there is, it doesn't have any consequences. But this train of thought ends up canonizing the tendencies that are in man today, which are bad. Um, Father Paolo used the word monstrous. Um, for example, if a person is obsessed with food and drink, what does that say? Well, the world would say hunger, thirst, sex, um, these are all natural instincts given by God. So they're good. There's no problem with them at all. However, if a person is obsessed by them, then they can be destructive in his life. They can carry him away from God. So even these natural drives bear the mark of sin. Saint Augustine clarified for us how these natural drives can take us away from God. He asked us to imagine a bridegroom and he brings his bride a beautiful gift, a wonderful, maybe a wonderful ring as a token of his love. Well, imagine that the girl grabs the ring 
and becomes so fascinated with it that she forgets about the bridegroom and turns away and just takes the ring and goes home with it and just sits looking at it, putting it on, contemplating it. She doesn't even remember her bridegroom. In that case, the gift, which was supposed to be a token of love, to bring the two together has actually separated the two. Well, the natural instincts can be like that. They were given to us by God to be enjoyed because he loves us. But sometimes in our fallen state, we can take the gift and use it to turn away from God. We have a tendency within ourselves to create an idol of something, to make something into God, which is not God. Food is not God, but if we worship it, it becomes our God. And as a small thing, it is a terrible God. It's a bad God. It's a bad idol. And so is sex or money or power. All these things, they can be gifts from God, but they cannot be God. Yet we have within ourselves the tendency to turn them into go gods, to turn them into gods. And so they separate us from God. This is where we are sick. This is our disease. The tendency, the crazy, crazy tendency to take the gifts of God, which are natural, and good and allow them to separate us from God. And the theological term for this tendency is original sin. And here we have another case of a word that can be used two ways. Let me explain it with an example. Suppose I say that a man, call him John, that John is healthy. That means he has the quality of health within himself. But what if I say that salad is healthy? Do I mean that salad has the quality of health within itself? No. I mean that salad brings health to a person when they eat it. Salad is a healthy thing to eat. Well, original sin can be understood in those same two ways. When I commit a sin, it's something I have done. It's not um, something that can be transferred from me to you. I have done it. It's my sin. And when Adam and Eve committed the first sin, it was original in the sense at, that it was the first sin that was ever committed. It was the original sin, the first sin, which they committed. They were responsible, not me. It's not something that could be transmitted from them to me or from them to anyone. Sin in that sense is not transmissible, but theologically, original sin has a different meaning. Let me use another example to clarify this. Suppose John, our friend, won the lottery. Suppose John won the lottery and got a lot of money. He became rich. And at the same time, his wife and his children all became rich. So he bought a big house and a car for each child, and a private airplane. The family became rich. It is our rags to riches story, which we have so many of in America. But John was not a good manager of the money. In fact, it only took him a couple of years to spend all of it. Not only did he spend all of it, he also borrowed money to invest in bad stocks. And when they failed, he couldn't pay the bills. 
So he had to sell everything he had bought at a loss. Every child's car was sold. The airplane, the everything, the big house, all sold. And still he had debt. And then John died, leaving a large debt for his children to pay. So now it's riches to rags. Who committed the stupidity of spending all the money and investing in bad stocks? John. Who ended up poor and in debt? His children and their children, even John's unborn children, became poor because of John's stupidity in spending all that money. So original sin is like this. We did not commit the original sin which made us poor, which made us indebted. Adam and Eve did. But the condition of indebtedness is transmitted to all of us with real consequences. We are marked by original sin, and we need to take it seriously. Now the next question is, why has God allowed this condition to exist? We are not guilty, but we bear the cost. We bear the consequence of the sin of someone else. It is not easy for us to understand what goes on in the mind of God. We only know some things. So questions like this are hard to answer, but there are certain things we do know. One of the things we know is that God takes us and our freedom seriously. And our freedom has consequences on ourselves and on those around us. A lot of people seem to want God to be like an overprotective mother who puts a bike helmet on her little two-year-old who's going out to ride a tricycle, lest the two-year-old fall over and bump her head on the, on the sidewalk. God is not like that. He protects us, but not excessively. And he does it in a way that preserves our freedom. If you do something bad, God will respect your freedom. He will let you do it. And then he will suffer with you as you get through the consequences. He comes down to suffer with us. What would have been the consequences if God had prevented Adam and Eve from committing the first original sin? The consequence would be that they would no longer have been free. And we, their unborn children, would not have been free either. You are only free if you can make a choice to do good or bad. If you have no choice to do bad, then you're not free anymore. But with that freedom comes a very terrible danger. Some sins that we commit can have irreparable effect. People don't like to believe this. They want to minimize the effect of sin or say that God will take it away. But sin is serious and we have to take it seriously. Imagine, for example, you are 15 years old and you have sex with your girlfriend who is 13 and she is a virgin. She has never had sex before. 
what could be more innocent? What could be more normal? What could be more natural? I'm sure God would not frown upon this. This is how he made us. That's what the world would say. But consider the effects. First, the girl will never be a virgin again. Her virginity is an irreparable loss. Now you may say, ah, oh, yeah, but that's not a big deal. That's not that important. It's a small thing. Well, what if she became pregnant? That's something you can't ignore. A new life, a new immortal has come into the universe. Well, you may say, she could get an abortion. She could make it go away. Well then, she has the stain of murder on her soul. And psychologically, she knows she has killed her child. But you may say, that's still a small thing. She won't be too badly hurt by that. No one is really too badly hurt by that. Well, what if you contracted a disease through your lifestyle of having sex with people? Um, maybe you could even get AIDS, not from this one act of uh, having sex with a virgin, but through having unprotected sex, through having, through having sex with multiple partners. Suppose you have, uh, you suppose you get a disease like AIDS, which cannot be cured. Can you see that this is irreparable? And what if before you die, you give that disease to other people, people you love, people you have sex with? Maybe you give it to lots of people. And that is also irreparable. Can you see how from one little sin that you could hardly call a sin comes an ever widening effect of ever more devastating consequences? The effects of sin are irreparable. They can be very, very serious, serious, and we need to take sin seriously. It can have consequences that you cannot reverse. And that was the case with original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. It had consequences they could not reverse. Eve thought, oh, I am eating an apple. And Adam joined her. And they never thought of the children within their body throughout the generations, thousands of years, who would be marked by sin, who would have a permanent tendency to sin from that moment on. The little sin, the bite of an apple, what could be more natural, plunged all of humanity into a tendency towards sin. The effect was irreversible. So now, we have all the same instincts that an animal has. The instinct to eat, to play, to have sex, but unlike an animal, we have a soul and we cannot be satisfied with these things alone. We need something more. Saint Augustine of Hippo said that we have a God-shaped vacuum in our soul. That means we have a, a hole in our soul that has a unique shape that only God can fill. And while it is unfilled, it hurts, it aches, it causes an emptiness in us. And it can't be filled by anything but God. We try to fill it with food and drink and money and sex and love and power and whatever. And it's never full and it always aches and it always bleeds. And there's only one thing, thing, one thing that can satisfy it, God himself. 
and St. Augustine said, we are always restless until we find our rest in thee, meaning God. We are never at peace until we are at peace with God. St. Gregory the Great described mankind as men of desire, men of desires. He was pointing out that we thirst and hunger and need and want, want, want. We just want and need all the time. And we are never satisfied. C.S. Lewis in The Four Loves talks about need love. How even our very love is need of the person that we love. But our hearts can only be satisfied with God. Do you feel this? Do you feel a restless hunger for something that you can't get? The answer to that hunger is probably God. And yet this world offers you a million things to satisfy your hunger, but nothing satisfies it. The only place it can be satisfied is in God, and we need to find the way to be satisfied in Him. So what are we proposing with this course? Well, first, we are going to explore and understand the way in which we are sick. We need to understand the details of our illness so that we can begin to understand the details of our cure. Now, of course, the only true cure will come at the resurrection after we die and go to God. But on earth, we can have a much better quality of life than if we were untreated. Imagine a person with cancer. If it is diagnosed and treated early, they can have a good life. Maybe they will eventually die, maybe of cancer, maybe of something else. But while they are living with the cancer, they can live a great life if they have the proper diet, exercise, and treatment. But if not, they will die quickly and painfully. So, in this course, we will understand what is the proper diet, exercise, and treatment for the sickness that ails us. Now we come to a part of the notes that I thought, when the students translated it for me, would not please you. It would not please most people in the American church. I hope you will not mind this because it is necessary. Now, in America, we don't want to work for our cure. We want to take a pill and be fixed. Or think of it this way. Suppose I am very fat. I am 200 pounds overweight. Or maybe I'm only 50 pounds overweight. I don't want to diet and exercise for a year, that would be too hard. I want to go to the doctor and have him cut it off, cut off the fat under my arms, cut off the fat on my stomach, cut off the fat under my neck. I want to look skinny easily. But I have found out that they can't just cut it off. You will look terrible. You'll have a big scar, you'll look mutilated. You will look like Frankenstein with scars where you were cut and stitches. And they can't just suck it out, liposuction. Because liposuction is not a treatment for obesity. If you just suck it out by liposuction, it will come back. 
you have to be at your proper weight in order to benefit from liposuction. There is no alternative. You have to stop eating so much and get some healthy exercise. And it takes a year or more. It takes a long time. And it becomes a life, lifestyle in order to maintain your healthy, beautiful weight and body. Well, it is the same way with the spiritual life. And what this course will teach you is how to pursue a life of asceticism. Now, asceticism is the word that I thought you would not like and the Church of America would not like. Asceticism means a life of discipline, self-discipline. And, um, and it is necessary. We live in, a, in an age where evil is running rampant in our world. It is like a, a tornado that sucks everything into itself. And you go into evil and you're just destroyed. The evil is sucking people in, right and left. And the only way the Church of God can stand up and be saved from this evil vortex that's sucking people in is if the Church becomes strong and you as an individual will not avoid being sucked in to the evil of this age if you do not develop a life that will make you strong spiritually. And that life is the life of asceticism. Now let us uh, go back to Father Paolo's notes to get a definition of asceticism. He says that he says that asceticism refers to a life of fasting, vigil, sacrifice, abstinence, and spiritual effort. He says we need to do this not only during Lent, but at other times as well. We are offering this course right now because it is Lent. Today is Ash Wednesday, and we will offer this course throughout Lent. But by learning the spiritual disciplines, we will practice them all year round in cycles. We do not diet all the time, but we diet regularly in order to maintain a healthy weight. We do not exercise 24 hours a day, but we exercise regularly in order to keep in shape. Well, spiritually, we need to get in shape in order to be able to withstand the forces of our age and also to be able to overcome. So, we need this life of asceticism. Father Paolo says, we need to understand that we are sick so that we will take care of our cure. He um, makes a comparison to a person with kidney failure. A person with kidney failure needs regular dialysis. They need to go to the hospital and have their blood run through a filter and then return to their body. It takes a few hours every week. And if they don't get it, they will be poisoned by their own waste material. If a person goes on vacation, they have to think, is there a hospital where I can get my dialysis? It's a condition of life that is permanent. All of us have spiritual kidney failure, and we need to learn about spiritual dialysis. And this course will teach it to us. So I hope that you will continue to lesson number two, and we'll begin to hear what Father Paolo has to say about the life of spiritual health. See you next time, and God bless.